So good morning everybody and a very warm welcome to today's on-page SEO masterclass. So over the years SEO may have gained a reputation for being boring, geeky and overly technical and unfortunately it is all those things but it's also too big a channel to ignore. In this webinar myself and Dave Clough are going to take you on a tour of our own in-house website auditing processes and using plain English we'll outline the need to knows and some of the typical quick wins available. Even if you're not an SEO practitioner, it's important to have an idea of what good SEO looks like and what really matters. You certainly don't have to be an expert in all things technical to understand the core principles of SEO. Um, most of it is pretty logical. Ultimately, Google just wants online users to have a positive experience and having a website that is technically sound is a very important part of that. So this is why Receptional has developed a customer-centric approach uh, to SEO. SEO isn't just about search engines, it's about your customers. We'll share practical tips which will enhance your user experience and Google will thank you and your ranks will benefit. What we're presenting to you today has been taken from our ebook which we released a couple of months back. So just before we begin, I shall take a moment to introduce you to today's speakers. We'll be hearing from Dave Clough, who is our Head of Content Strategy at Receptional. Dave has over 10 years of experience working in SEO, and he's previously been an SEO manager at Argos. He has also worked across numerous sectors, inclusive of finance, retail, technology, hospitality, and many more. His work at Receptional has earned him a double award win at the Digital Experience Awards, and he's also been a guest speaker at the Content Marketing Association, the Financial Services Forum, the Financial Times, as well as speaking at Google's head office. And I'm Simon Lachlan, the Business Development Manager at Receptional, and I've been with the company now for over three years. I have over 17 years of experience working in consultative business development and account management roles, and I've worked with clients in both the public and private sectors across the UK and Ireland. Some of the industries I've worked with range from finance, retail, e-commerce, uh, professional services, and many more. So over the last 20 years, Receptional has successfully worked with some of the UK's best known brands. And you can see a few examples there on the screen in front of you now. So let's take a quick look at what's coming up in today's session. We will be starting off by looking at keyword usage and alignment, followed by uh, website content and page loads before moving on to website crawling and duplicate content. Finally, we will be running a Q&A session at the end, so if there's anything that you wish to ask us throughout the course of the session, uh, please use the uh, questions box, which you'll find on the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So due to the complexities of on-page SEO, we'll not be able to cover everything in today's session. Each of these items could potentially warrant its bespoke own webinar. So what we've done is we've prioritised items that we will uh, we believe are most relevant and of course if there's something that we don't cover that you'd like more information on then please feel free to get in touch. So what is good SEO? Well it's made up of two elements. The firstly is on-page SEO which is the process of optimising the site and online content for both search engines and its users. It's essentially what we are saying about ourselves. Secondly, it's off-page, which refers to link building and digital PR, or in other words, what other people are saying about you. This in itself is a complicated and varied area and one that we can examine in a future webinar. But to put it another way, on-page SEO is a lot more in your control than off-page. Both are as equally as important as each other for achieving a great SEO strategy, but today we'll be focusing on the on-page. From an investment point of view, on-page SEO is a no-brainer. It's often a lot cheaper compared to ongoing link building work and it lays the foundations for future success and therefore enables stronger ROI from link building activity. And there are always uh, on-page quick wins to be had, which we're gonna focus on some of today. So if you're link building without a strong on-page SEO, you're probably having to overcompensate at huge costs. So without further delay, I shall now hand you over to Dave to talk about keyword alignment and usage. Brilliant, thank you very much, Simon, and good morning, everybody. So when you're starting an SEO campaign, the first question you need to answer is, what searches do you want to rank for? As this will form uh, the foundation of your strategy going forward. Keyword alignment is the process of preparing your website to rank for those keywords. 
keyword research is a topic worthy of its own webinar. So for today, we'll assume that you have a good idea of what keywords you should be optimizing for. Now, once you've decided on your keywords, the next step is to optimize your pages. Now, keyword optimization is pretty simple. When you search for something on Google, they find content that matches what you're searching for. In this example, when you search for how to retire early, Google returns an article on how to retire early. And in some ways, it's as simple as that. The best way to label your content is through the use of page titles. Page titles are displayed in Google uh, when a website ranks for a search term. They are also the first thing that Google looks at when deciding what your page is about. This makes page titles one of the best and easiest ways to optimize a web page. Now, page titles are pretty easy to write. There's just a few rules to remember. Uh, firstly, page titles should contain keywords. In this example, I'd assume that Smith Toys were wanting to rank for PS5 keywords. There's a limit to how many characters are displayed in Google. They typically display the first 50 to 60 characters. Any longer than that, and you get those nasty dot, dot, dots at the end. So make sure that the important information, i.e. your target keyword, is somewhere at the beginning of the title. Another rule to observe is that page titles should contain your brand name at, at the end. Uh, we recommend using a pipe symbol as a separator as they take up fewer pixels than hyphens. Now, there's an exception to this rule, uh, which is the home page where Google prefers to see the brand at the beginning of the page title. And here's what happens if you don't include the brand. Kilney's homepage title is award-winning financial planning, wealth and investment services. However, they've neglected to include their brand name. As a result, Google are ignoring the page title completely and they're just displaying Tilney. This is obviously just a small oversight, but it's far from optimal. So headings help break up page copy and enable users to scan for information. Including keywords and headers is highly recommended as they provide Google with further keyword validation and they're also used to index your pages for subtopics. Like with titles, there's a few simple rules to remember. Firstly, there should be only one H1 tag per page. Uh, also, optimize H1s for your primary keywords. Our advice here is to simply, simply to replicate your page titles as a header minus the brand name. Keyword optimized internal links can pass SEO value to the important pages that you want to rank on Google. Uh, you can go through your blogs, spot for keywords, and make sure they link to your uh, main pages for some bonus SEO power. And if you're feeling a little ambitious and want to take this task to the next level, you can use backlink data to find the most linked to pages on your website and add internal links from those pages to your money pages where it's relevant to do so. You can get a list of the most linked to pages simply in your Google Search Console account. Here we can see a couple of articles on the receptional website that have been linked to multiple times from external websites. Therefore, we have added internal links on those pages to our main SEO uh, services landing pages to boost their ranks. Simple keyword research um, optimization can be really, really effective. Here we can see the keyword ranks before and after our optimization work for a London-based audio production house. We conducted keyword research and aligned the main pages to the most sought after terms. Uh, and we saw an overnight shift in performance before we'd even begun any link building activity. As a result, they saw their SEO sessions increase 49% before and after our work. And now I'm going to pass back to Simon, who's going to talk you through website content do's and don'ts. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Um, I think when it comes to content length, this is something we get asked about uh, quite a lot, how much content is required. Um, well, providing a certain amount of uh, written, crawlable copy on each page is actually an SEO requirement. For years, there's been debate over how much copy is needed. Historically, people have said things like a minimum of 500 words on every page or even upwards of 1,000. But the truth is it's completely down to the context of the page and the situation. So how much is required depends on the type of content. So for example, an e-commerce homepage may have lots of product names and images, but little written content. An agency landing page may have just a few short paragraphs if it's optimized for mobile. Um, but if it's a blog or an article, then the copy will be uh, more in depth. However, 
um, there is more to this debate than even these uh, answers provide. In Google's opinion, the most important factor is customers' needs, and strict SEO guidelines can't really take that into full consideration. Meanwhile, the majority of your customers will be browsing on mobile devices. The exact figures vary depending on who you ask. However, some st statistics say that up to 59% are surfing on mobile devices. We strongly recommend that you look at your own data, which is easy to find in Google Analytics. But there's also another factor to consider as well. And according to the Telegraph, humans have an attention span of about eight seconds, which is a decrease from 12 seconds in the year 2000. So if I can have your attention for the next eight seconds, how much of the following web page do you take in? Sorry about that, the slides jumped. There we go. So there we go, how far did you get? Perhaps most of you picked up that Bill Plant were National Driving School of the Year in 2019. Um, they have high quality tuition vehicles, local driving instructors, and so forth. What you probably didn't do in that eight seconds is reach the uh, call to action um, at the bottom, which was uh, to, to book a driving lesson. So if we were to do the same experiment again in the next eight seconds, how much of the following page uh, do you take in? So I should imagine that this time round, you've picked up on all of the key messaging from the previous example, but you also know what action to take next, i.e. book that driving lesson. So that was a real example uh, from this page that we redesigned, where we removed as much of the copy as possible, and we got a 160% increase in inquiries without losing any rankings. So it goes to show that content length is the wrong question to ask, and that focusing on the quality of the content is key instead. So why does the website design matter? Well, because from Google's point of view, they want their users to have a good experience. Google's opinion is that this is the single most important thing. And what do your customers want? Well, 85% of them believe that the mobile experience should be as good, if not better, than desktop. So that's why we redesigned those example pages specifically for mobile. And when we talk about content quality, it ultimately boils down to making pages primarily for users, not for search engines. Don't deceive your users, avoid tricks intended to improve search engine rankings, and think about what makes your website unique, valuable, and engaging. Just aim to produce the best user experience possible and make sure that the content delivers on what the title and the heading have promised. And I shall now hand you back to Dave to cover off page load and code. Cool, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, the fastest moving area of SEO at the moment is its relationship with user experience. After all, as Simon explained, Google favors sites that best serve their users. Page load speed is a huge part of this, and believe me, Google knows your website is slow. Using Google's own page speed tools, you can see how fast or slow Google thinks your website is. To many SEO professionals, Page load speed might seem like the responsibility of web developers and hosting companies, but there's some quick wins that can make a huge difference to a slow website. The good news is that Google now tell us what they think of your website in your own Search Console account, and they call it Core Web Vitals. Core Web Vitals is a report in Search Console which tells us how your pages perform in the real world. This is a huge step up from scoring pages based on coding best practices and other off often misleading signals about your usability. There are three things Core Web Vitals measures. LCP, which stands for Largest Contentful Paint. This is the time it takes to load the largest element on the page. Typically, this is an image or a video. There's FID, which stands for First Input Delay. This is the time it takes from when a user first interacts with your page to the time it takes for the browser to respond to that interaction. Basically, this measures website lag. And finally, there's CLS, and this stands for Cumulative Layout Shift. This is the amount of the page that, uh, layout that shifts during the loading phase, phase. Typically, large numbers of images causes this to be an issue. 
On the overview page of the Core Web Vitals report, you'll notice there's three categorizations of data. Poor needs improvement and good. Like Google's telling us exactly what good looks like, and that's really handy of them. The entire data set is also split into desktop and mobile, which is critical. We often see that pages look fine on a desktop PC, but the cumulative layout shift is dreadful on a mobile device. Also, page load speed issues often impact mobile devices more so than desktops. We cannot stress this enough. If Google gives you a report on something, you should pay attention to it. And here's a real life example of exactly why. We noted a drop in ranks for a client of ours back in January. This dip correlated with a sudden drop in the page load speed, resulting in an increase in poor URLs shown to us by Core Web Vitals. We flagged it with the developers and within a few days it was fixed and the keyword positions were recovered immediately, placing our client back on top, beating the likes of Argos, Halfords, Boots and John Lewis, to name just a few. If you've noticed a drop in your ranks, Core Web Vitals is one of the first places you should look to see if there's an issue. If your pages are slow, images are often the problem and usually the easiest way to improve page load speed without any heavy duty uh, dev work. Poor image file sizes are unbelievably common and occur because many are unaware of the impact that unoptimized images are having on the performance of their website. So make sure that anybody involved in maintaining your website prepares images appropriately before they're uploaded. Images should be saved at the dimensions they're to be viewed at. Ideally, the file sizes should be below 100 kilobytes. Use JPEGs for photos and PNGs for illustrations to get the best ratio of quality and manageable file sizes. I'm going to pass back to Simon now, who's going to talk about the complicated subject of website crawling. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, if you want Google to rank your pages, then you must make sure that you can uh, that these pages, sorry, can be crawled and accessed by Google. So crawling in simple terms is the process undergone by search engines to follow every link on the web to discover and index web pages that it can then later return as search results. So when auditing uh, websites, it's vital that you yourself can crawl your site. And if you'd like to do this, then the tool you need is called Screaming Frog. There are other tools available, but this is what we use to conduct our analysis. So when it comes to the website's crawlability, there's a number of elements that we look at, starting with site hierarchy. Google can determine the importance of a page depending on its position within the URL structure. Folders should mimic the flow of your navigation, indicating how many levels you are away from this homepage. Doing this helps Google understand the page's importance. It leads to Google having a better understanding of the website. It's like having a tidy folder system on your desktop. So yeah, who's, hands up whose uh, desktop looks like this. If you don't have a tidy URL structure, Google's crawlbots will see your website in the same way that you're seeing this desktop. And as you can see, it really is a mess. Um, Google would rather rank a well-organized website than something that looks like this. The next element we look at is internal links, which are how both users and search engines find their way around your site. So healthy internal links are a must. When Google requests a page from the server, the server responds with a status code. The code then tells us more about that link. The most common of which is the 200. This means that the page is found and that all is good. Some other status codes to be aware of are things like the 301 redirect. This is where a page has permanently moved to a new URL. There's no problem with that in most cases. However, internal redirects should be avoided by updating them to point to their final destination directly rather than going through a redirect. So why are 301s bad? Well, because it's sending a signal to Google that the site is poorly maintained. 302s are also another kind of read, redirect to tell search engines that the page move is only temporary. Uh, these are even worse than 301s if they are used incorrectly because the link power or the link equity is not carried over. And finally, one that we're probably all familiar with is 404s. This means that the page you've requested does not exist, and it's essentially a dead end for both search engines and the users. The bottom line is, internal links should always return a 200 OK status code. You generally don't want to see any 404s, 301s, 302s when crawling a website. Fixing broken links can offer a nice boost to your SEO performance. And now back to Dave. 
Excellent, thank you. I think this is the final uh, section of today's uh, webinar and it's duplicate content. Now, we're not talking about where you've used the same paragraph of copy on multiple pages. That's a different kind of duplication that you also shouldn't do. What we're talking about is a single page on your website which is accessible via multiple different URL versions. So Google is sensitive to upper and lower cases in URLs, subdomains such as www and non www. Uh, pro protocols, i.e. HTTP and HTTPS, and trailing slashes, the slash at the end of a URL and whether or not it is or isn't present. If your server allows uh, a page to be accessed via different combinations of those factors, uh, then that's an issue because Google treats unique URLs as unique pages. Google will therefore perceive these different URLs as duplications. And Google does not like duplicate content. Now you can try this out for yourself on your own website now. If you go to your website and double click on the URL in the browser uh, and it will reveal the full URL with the protocols and subdomains showing. For instance, HTTPS www.receptional.com with a trailing slash is ours. Right, then remove the www dot and hit go and see what happens. If your browser takes you back to the www dot version, then great, you've been redirected to the master URL and that's a good thing. If not, that's not so great because it means you might have a duplicate content problem. You can then try switching that up with HTTPS and HTTP and then combining with or without, with, with or without, www dot, with or a trailing slash, without a trailing slash, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and all of those should resolve on one master URL version. We call that master URL the canonical URL. So canonical is a word thrown around SEO circles a lot, and it's well worth grasping what it means. With that in mind, our final stop is looking at canonical URLs and tags. Uh, now canonicals can be quite confusing, so I'm gonna try to break it down into small chunks. So canonical tags are used to prevent the perception of duplicate content when duplicate, duplicate content is unavoidable and an essential part of a website's user journey. For instance, e-commerce sites use filters to help customers find products. In this example, I'm on the Tesco's website and I'd like to buy some craft beers. The canonical URL is tesco's.com slash groceries slash drinks slash craft beer. I'm a BrewDog fan, so I've applied the BrewDog filter. Uh, my filter has created a dynamic URL, adding what we call a parameter, which sits at the end of the URL seen in red in this slide. You can detect parameters because they usually have question marks at the beginning of the parameter part. This uh, URL is essential for the user journey and the functioning of the website, but it's actually the same web page, only with fil uh, products are filtered. Uh, this unfortunately creates a duplicate page in the eyes of Google, and we don't want Google to penalize Tesco's for it. So the good news is uh, you can use a canonical tag, which tells Google to ignore the dynamic version of the URL and saves the day. So there's a few rules to remember with canonical tags. Um, no matter what the address bar says, the canonical tag should reference the one true version of the URL, not the dynamic version. Uh, it must use the correct case, use the correct trailing slash format, uh, not reference completely different URLs uh, and not contain any tracking parameters. So I know that canonical tags sound complicated. Um, however, most content management systems by default set the permalink as the canonical. So it's one of those things that should look after itself in theory, but not always in practice. Ultimately, if your redirects, your internal links are all sensible, then your canonical tag structure should be quite easy to maintain. I'm going to pass back to Simon, who is going to wrap up today's session. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Um, yeah, this is just a quick overview then of the areas that we've covered. Uh, we hope you've found these useful. Appreciate that they are short and snappy just because of the sort of level of detail you could potentially go into. Um, we will be sending out a copy of the slides and a very short survey about today's session. So if you can kindly spend uh, 30 seconds filling that out when you when, when you receive that, as we'd, we'd greatly appreciate your feedback. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, just before we uh, head over to the questions, uh, if any of you do need 
any sort of help with your all important on page SEO, then we can run technical audits that address all of the points that we've covered in today's session, as well as many that we haven't. Um, so if you'd like to book one or if you'd like a discussion about what one of these entails, then uh, please reach out to us and let us know. And with that being said, then uh, let's take a look at some of your questions. And thank you for those who have, who have popped those in. So uh, the first question, uh, what's more important, including your brand or making sure your title isn't cut off? Ah, of course, that refers to, to my section at the beginning. Um, yeah, I mentioned those dot, dot, dots that you get when the, the page title is too long. Uh, you have to have a brand at the end uh, included in your page title. I mentioned that example earlier with Tilney, uh, where, where they missed out the brand and Google doesn't like to see that. Um, so you, you have to have your brand and it should be at the end. The reason why it's at the end is so the keywords can sit at the front of the title and that's the most important thing. Um, if someone's searching for a non-brand keyword like um, how to retire early, they're more interested in the question than they are the brand who's serving the answer. So it's more important that the question sit, the keyword sits at the beginning of the title. Uh, I think Google's um, title lengths are quite stingy. So it's, yeah, it's quite difficult to get that dot, dot, dot or to stop it, especially on um, blog content, for instance, where they, you tend to have longer titles. Uh, so it's one of those things that's quite inevitable. Um, but if your main service landing pages uh, do try keep it under that 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 um, uh, that character count, there, there's a that, that is, there's a trade-off. We we in SEO do our absolute best to keep the title short, but it's, sometimes it's unavoidable, and it, the the, page, the brand should be in there no matter what at the end. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dave. So the next one we have is how many different keywords can one page rank for? Can I optimize one page for designers or design services and interior design, for example, or do I need three pages? Okay, cool. So this is, um, I think, a question of, of context and synonyms, really. Uh, so it's quite hard to answer this without looking at specific examples. Um, but what I would say is that if you have a bunch of similar synonym keywords, you don't need to have like a different page for every single synonym. Google's pretty smart at understanding the relationship between different keywords. Uh, and often you can optimize a single page for um, a few closely linked keywords and synonyms uh, while still remaining within the character count as well. Um, so I think it comes back to that question of user journey and user experience again. If the, uh, the, if the con or the topic is complicated or nuanced enough to warrant its own unique page, then that's what will serve the customer better than that's what you should do. If you're writing content for the sake of keywords and search engines, then you're going about things the wrong way. You're, you're, you're optimizing towards for Google, not for customers. And, that, and Google doesn't want you to see you doing that. So um, yeah, I think as long it comes down to user experience again as, as, as a rule of thumb. Uh, if the content is gonna serve the user, do it. Do two, two versions if it, if it warrants it. If you're optimizing just for keywords, then um, you pr you probably are good enough to have just one page. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and the next question in uh, sorry is, <laughs> what are the important steps to optimizing website SEO in different countries, such as UK and US site? Uh, the important steps for optimizing. Um, Again, I think it depends on the size of the business and the market. Um, a dot com can rank quite adequately in England, for instance, whereas in, in the US, a dot co UK might struggle. Um, both of those sites are in English, so it's not necessarily a question of href lang. Um, and href lang is used for different languages, such as uh, English and French. You'd have to have different language versions. Um, so, generally speaking, uh, I would have thought between the for the UK and US a dot com would be sufficient for both of those markets. Um, cool. Outside of so, yeah different language versions, then we're into um, it, the complicated world of international SEO, which actually we really should follow up with with a bespoke uh, webinar at some point soon. I think. Okay. Uh, next question: As a startup business and having to cover multiple marketing disciplines. How often would you recommend auditing all of your SEO? Can you ask that question again, please? Yeah, sure. As a startup business and having yeah. to cover multiple marketing disciplines, how often would you recommend auditing all of your SEO? Cool. Yeah, 
if you're a startup, if it's a new website, um, my highest recommendation is that you, you consider SEO right at the beginning uh, of your journey because um, you have to build a website anyway. It's a lot easier to optimize a website for, at its conception rather than after the site's gone live. Um, so baking SEO into the core is essential because uh, it's a lot easier to do that than retrospectively. In terms of ongoing auditing, well, if you've built the site correctly in the first place, it should just be a case of maintenance. And we would recommend uh, a quick audit um, annually. I mean, with our clients, we report monthly on our keyword ranks. If we see a, a significant shift in performance, positively or negatively, we'll always investigate as, as to what might be the cause, while also keeping an eye on algorithm changes to, to see if there's anything that might impact the website potentially. But um, so you don't need to sort of, uh, once you've got it set up correctly, you don't need to obsess over it. Just keep an eye on your reports and, and, and remain agile in that regard. Uh, and then, yeah, annually probably would be a good time to do an MOT. Cool. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, we've got one more. It's just uh, where can we download the uh, deck? So, yeah, uh, Nick, we'll send a copy of the slides out for you. And I'll tell you what, we'll also um, we'll add a copy of the recording as well, because this session is being recorded. Um, so we'll send that that link out um, once it's available uh, when I when I follow up after the session today. So. Um, so don't worry, you don't have to screenshot every uh, every slide that you've seen in the session. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that kind of wraps wraps up all the questions that we've had. And thank you for everybody for those, uh, and thank you for everybody uh, to everybody. Sorry for, for for joining us today on the session. Hope you found it useful. Um, like I say, we'll follow up with the slides and the recordings. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you again on our future and upcoming webinars. So thank you very much. Uh, take care and have a good day, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Rob. Take care.